Welcome to the Impact Learning Visionaries podcast, where we celebrate the unsung heroes of the learning and development industry. As always, we'll be bringing some laughter and a bit of fun along the way, but more importantly, you'll get some incredible insights, key lessons, and unique perspectives on everything related and possibly unrelated to training and development. Let's get this show on the road. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Impact Learning Visionaries podcast. And with us today, we have Katja Schipperein. Um, again, she might be smiling at me because I, I've been practicing that. Um, but uh, Katja is an internationally recognized learning and development strategy strategist and uh, the founder of Habit of Improvement which is a consultancy that focuses on equipping organizations with learning strategies for the future. Uh, Katja has got two decades of experience as a manager and trusted advisor to numerous multinationals, helping them to develop collaboration tools, knowledge sharing and learning frameworks that foster growth and excellence. She is also an author, a guest lecturer, a keynote speaker on ecosystem thinking and innovation to support learning and knowledge sharing. So not an overachiever at all. Um, her well-known book, Learning Ecosystems, Creating Innovative, Lean, and Tech-Driven Learning Strategies, is really a must-read for any business looking for practical ways to improve their learning strategies. Katja, welcome to the show. And um, from the early conversation we had just prior to starting the recording, you mentioned something which I think is very, very pertinent. And I'd like to actually start with that question is whenever we talk about this concept of learning and development, we often think about the learning and development divisions in a company. But you have a very different take on who your book is actually positioned for. Do you want to just give us some insight into that? Well, it is a, indeed, as you said, about strategy. Learning and development is no longer the responsibility of a team living in a silo called L&D. It's the responsible of people themselves, people that want to grow, have a career, or even be employed in the next coming years. So I think it's the leadership team that needs to provide this environment. And yes, they can use L&D, they need L&D because we still need some formal part of learning, but creating the culture to grow with employees, that's strategy. And in these days, this is also technology. And I think if L&D stays in their silo without talking to the stakeholders, the employees, the IT department, the business people, then we will not see companies growing from learning anymore. And um, how, how do you convince, because I, I think the, the, the challenge that you've really outlined there is, is a historical one, right? Because L&D was born out of human resources and human resources is often a division of a business which is managed by the CFO or the COO. And, um, and I apologize because I probably will offend every single HR and L&D person on the planet, but often it's, it's kind of where strategy goes to die, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's, it's what you said. Um, L&D is born out of HR, and mm -hmm. HR is in very, very, well, most of the company is still owned by the CFO, so it's a cost. Mm -hmm. And there is a first problem. Also, the people that are going in L&D, they, they know a lot about people and development and they use old frameworks like Bloom's Taxonomy and all the others that I described in my book. And those old systems, even 70, 20, 10, they don't use technology. Learning happens anywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Being informed through a chat is actually informal learning, but we don't measure this, so we can't put it in the framework. So if L&D is monitored by KPIs from an old system and they have to report to the CFO, well, I don't need more explanation. The system is broken. Hmm. <laughs> and, um, and look, I, I, I guess, you know, the, the positive thing is, is I've, I've spoken to lots of learning and development specialists, and I, I think there's an understanding that 
learning and development is so integral and affects so many parts of the organization from you know employee branding what the first experiences of a new person starting in your business um, how you're perceived in the market how how you essentially um, you know kind of of drive this this human capital that sits in your business to achieve real real business outcomes and not just in the old old world of you know what came out of a performance review um, because mm-hmm. someone thought that they had to tick a training box um, for that employee on the other side of the table so it it is I think there are definitely positive steps but if if we start to look I think a lot of your book talks about this new world and the new challenges we're going to face in this emerging kind of future of work, which is very much a technology driven world that we are going to now start to have to navigate and become relevant in. And what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that most businesses are are going to be facing as they move into this future of working world? Well, there are a lot of challenges indeed. Uh, One is indeed the technology part. Uh, more than 70% according to McKinsey globally in all functions across the company those people know that they need to learn to keep up with the technology this is simple things like teams changing all the time uh, how they have to do the reporting the data that they need to analyze and even now and I don't want to tell you but chat GPT chat boxes how are they going to impact a lot of the work that we're doing, even for consultants, for uh, lawyers. So I think uh, keeping up with technology is difficult for people. So this is about culture. How can we let these people know that they don't have to be anxious about it, that they can experience the joy of learning? This is a competence. I I also discuss a lot about how we can learn from Mm -hmm. children. Be curious. Don't see it as a burden, like I have to learn. So the cultural part is absolutely one of the uh, challenges that we are looking at. Uh, That is not responsibility of HR. It's leadership, showing examples that leadership is also growing. I think the biggest challenge for the new ways of work is the silo structured organizations. Um, I talk in my book about cross-functional teams, people that want to work for projects. If you want to hire, you were talking Mm about uh, your branding, real talent. They don't want to be doing the same always. They like to be challenged. Uh, They like to work on projects. I discuss a case from a global bank in my book where people can go to their talent platform and apply for a one month job in something completely different to experience new things. Even if they go back to their old job, they bring in all this experience and knowledge Mm. from the cross-functional teams. I'm also discussing gig economy. The gig economy. I know so many people like myself that are um, self-employed, but sometimes we take a job for six months in a company. The funny thing is, well, it's actually not funny, it's very sad, is that I can't log into the systems of this company because I'm external to the HR legacy system and they can't put me in. They can't even give me a login on their own Teams accounts because I'm external. So I can't put my knowledge into the systems of the company. Hmm. So all the knowledge that I bring to them is gone. Also, I cannot tap into the knowledge already existing in the company. But the gig economy is growing and very, very fast. So I think the biggest challenge, and that's a learning ecosystem, how can we connect all the knowledge that we need from our internal teams, from our external knowledge uh, providers to learn from it all the time? I call this lean learning, making sure that we get the learning, the information that we need to perform in the job to bring added value to the ecosystem. So I think the gig economy, I'm reading, I'm looking at it, I'm talking to a lot of people. I think that's a big challenge that we will face mm. in all kinds of uh, functions. So you, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned the gig economy and and you know digital nomads are nothing new. They've been they've been around for for like a decade or two. Um, 
the the interesting thing I think that um, that you mentioned there is is more the challenge that poses to to existing businesses, and I, you know, there, there are probably reasons why businesses do have to behave in a certain way. You know, there's there's all sorts of governance requirements and protection of personal information, and so. It, it presents quite a complex systemic challenge, I think, to a lot of, of people in business and l and is, is they must sometimes feel that they're sitting between a bit of a rock and a hard place where they really want to actually do all this cool stuff you're saying, but at the same time, they are almost victims of a industrial age machine that behaves in a certain way and has certain kind of corporate governance requirements. And how, how do you deal with that? Well, we see it everywhere. Um, I thought the pandemic would help us to do the things different, but we all wanted to go back to the old normal. But think about the education system. It's from the 1700s. We all try to hold on on what we know because we see a lot of problems. We only see the problems, but we see the surface of the problem. And we don't see... To the root cause, I explain this in the book. This is one of the most important things that we should do is, this is a problem that we see. But why is this a problem? For who is this a problem? Why is this holding us back? And if you really drill down with all the stakeholders of your organization to the root cause of the problem, then you see opportunities rising up from that. Just quick wins opportunities. We can't change the system in one go. I always say if we want to innovate, slow down innovation. Don't try to do the big step at once. Just tackle it step by step. The legacy systems in the companies, you can't throw them out. I know. I tried this with some companies that say, get, get it out, get it out. It's not working. You can't. Just not in one day. So my advice always is don't look at the problems that we face because there are too many. We can't tackle them all. Take a big problem, root cause analysis, what are the opportunities arising from that? And then little steps for improvement. Of course, it's not lost on me that um, what you've just described is critical thinking. And <laughs> critical thinking is seen to be one of the fundamental skills that are needed for the future of work. Um, so wh why do you think, um, we struggle so much with this concept of critical thinking. Well, you saw that in my book, I describe a lot of competences that we need for the future. Most of those competences were actually beaten out of us when we were still at school, like curiosity. I was one of these children always, why, why, why? Shut up, go out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but critical thinking, I don't describe critical thinking as such in the book. I talk about openness. Openness is critical thinking, but understanding why somebody else might have a problem with that. If we only do critical thinking in a team, then we have a lot of no-nos. You might remember this funny book, My Iceberg is Melting. If we don't try to understand why somebody else doesn't want to move our direction, we all keep stuck in our critical thinking with our experiences from the past. So I want the new competence, openness. Be critical, but understand that the world is changing. Be open to new things. Understand that other people have other experiences. Communicate, talk about that. And then critical thinking is not negative anymore because in many organizations I see critical thinking, no, and it ends. <laughs> um. Yes, I, I, I kind of agree with, with, with that statement. I think a lot of organizations generally tend to fall into the trap of behaving very analytically and um, looking for data and for certainty um, before they try new ideas. Now, I mean, coming, coming back to um, the, the, the critical thinking side and, and just the, the kind of whole future of work thing, um, and you talked a little bit about this, the school system and and what drives us and, and the fact that we need openness. Um, where, where do you think we, we, we lose that? Because I think as, as children, as you spoke about in the book, we, we generally are naturally curious, naturally open to ideas and, and feedback, but somewhere along the way, um, we lose that. And I guess the reason 
I'm asking the question, the underlying root cause, <laughs> as you would say, <laughs> is is I I feel that what what your book is trying to to kind of of drive is a new way of thinking, and. The, the biggest obstacle, I guess, is people's resistance to change. And often technology and adoption of technology and new ideas is the thing that is most resistant to change. So where do we lose that openness and, and how do we get it back? I love the question. Uh, my first book, which was written in 2018, was Little Digital Citizens. For now, only in Dutch. I might rewrite it in English. I've seen over 15,000 children in my workshops with my non-for-profit organization. I was recently on the islands in the Caribbean visiting schools because they are very pre-digital age. Um, to understand indeed what is happening, I talk a lot to children age 9, 10, 11, because this is the age that I see that they're changing. They need to start really learning. They need to think about what they want to do in high school. They need to do a lot of tests. Uh, still in many schools around the globe, they need to work alone. So I see some schools when they have to do an exam, they have still a wall between them so that they can look to what other children are doing. That's the first thing. They never learn to collaborate, do it alone. They cannot ask children, to give you again an example, my, my own daughter, who's 17, was giving a um, presentation about women rights. Apparently her teacher didn't have the same open ideas about it, so she got a very bad grade. So they learn to do everything for the grades because they need to come home and make mom and daddy happy for the grades they all need to go still to the university which is rubbish so i think it's it's a schooling system from a very young age trying to be all sheeps but that was indeed the way that our schooling system is built from the 1700s from germany because at that time all the children needed to go to work in a factory doing all the same so i know it's it's a very big, bold idea that I have to change mm. all the education system from the beginning because it starts when they're five, six years old and they lose all curiosity at the age of eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so you mentioned ChatGPT earlier, and I think you, know, you and you talked about the education system, and, and I, I do believe that if we don't change the education system, and, and all the teachers out there pay attention to this, is that your, your jobs are easily replaceable by, you know, kind of, of really, really um, mature AI. I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but, you know, we've already educated how many people on Google alone. And when you add another layer of intelligence um, and intelligent context to what Google produces, you end up with ChatGPT. And I can imagine, you know, if, if we don't change the education system, the future of education is really actually just, you know, teachers on demand, which is nothing other than I can ask, you know, as I need to learn stuff, I can ask a chat GPT engine for that relevant information in the right context at the right time when I need it. Do you agree? Disagree? It's lean learning and... I agree on some parts about mm. ChatGPT, education, AI, and indeed uh, the way that we learn. I have to say, for now, I'm not 100% a fan of ChatGPT, even for, uh, because it gives a lot of misinformation. Mm. So we need more critical thinking. I think schools should embrace the idea uh, to have children working with it, young people working with it, to work around critical thinking. Um, most teachers are really afraid of it. Um, going back to technology um, and chat GPT is one thing, but when I was on the islands in the Caribbean, I asked to the children the question, how do you see the future of learning? How do you want to change your school? But I also asked them about technology and asked, is one of you a creator on Roblox? This is geek economy for children. Mm -hmm. And I see this 11 year old girl, very shy, raising her hand. I said, are you creating games for others? 
And she nodded because she was really looking around. She was actually a little bit afraid. I said, this is so cool. Are you earning Robux, which is cryptocurrency? And she nodded again. I said, do your parents know? And she didn't know anything, so I don't think they know. The teacher asked me, what is it? And I explained it. I said, this is a kid knowing about strategy in games. She knows about coding. She knows about 3D imaging. She's a phenomenon. And I said, and I ask this a lot when I speak at conferences. When she is 12 and she needs to go to secondary school, but she's a millionaire on Robux. So she decides that she wanna work for your company in the L&D department, creating cool games for your employees to learn. Would you hire her? And then you see the people like, no, I say this is a big loss because when she's 16, she needs to learn stuff that she really doesn't find interesting. She probably needs to get a bachelor or even a master before mm. you hire her. This is a loss for the child, for the company, for the ecosystem and the organization. Learning happens for children in a different world. So when I talk about l and I talk about a lot about did the future already caught up with us? Yes, it did. They are in the gig economy. They like to work for projects. They're earning money sometimes at the age of nine. They know how to keep their money. So I hmm. think the educational system, if we could do something with all these technologies, with blockchain, for example, what if we give her already a certificate that she doesn't need to do those courses when she goes for her bachelor, only maybe the courses to set up her own company. And then she can do it in one year. But it, it, it's not happening. I'm asking and talking about this since I think 2015. I don't see much hmm. change. What about the conundrum there of you don't know what you don't know? And, and what I mean by that is, is, is one of maybe the 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 benefits of going through a catch-all educational system is that there's a lot of foundational things that you are taught along the way that, that benefit you in many ways later on in life. So I, I can imagine that the the argument to following that very linear Roblox kind of approach is there might be other kind of transition like translational skills that you learn which you might never have been experienced to if you don't go through a more generalized educational path. I agree with you. We were discussing before we started recording that we both studied Latin. Mm -hmm. I think we both were not that good at it. Terrible. It, give us some, <laughs> it, it, it gave us some foundation, not only about the Latin, but also about when you study Latin, they tell you also about the history of Latin. It's about anthropology. Where are we coming from? I think these are basic things that we need to know. Um, we, critical thinking is something that you learn also when you study Latin. Uh, so yes, I think we still need proper schooling. I think we still need curriculum. I still think we need to do some kind of testing, not so much about the testing, but to see where is somebody's talent? Where can we grow them? I'm still in favor of testing as well uh, for L&D departments, and I think a lot of technology tools, they can even do um, testing on confidence. While you are performing something on a machine, the machine can measure if you're confident about it, which is critical when you're building a equipment, for example, because if the machine can detect that you are not confident building this part of the machine, then at the end of the line, you can do more quality testing on it. So I'm in favor of testing. I'm in favor of the schooling system. I only want both in schools and in L&D departments to be more lean. Give mm. that information to the person who needs it in this stage of the age. Make it more hybrid. And I know hybrid, I, I say it in the book, is the most misused word especially since 2020. For me, hybrid is not like we do part digital and part formal in a training or in a school. It is about making sure that in your lifelong learning path, sometimes you need to do a lesson, for example. Sometimes you just need the information. 
sometimes you need to go to a course, but don't try to make this path the same for everybody. And this is a challenge for l and I don't say a problem. You will mm. never hear me say a problem, but a challenge and an opportunity for l and but also for the schooling system. Coming back on the first thing that you say, the impact of AI on uh, learning and development, I think AI can help us a lot to create these learning paths, these diverse learning paths, coming back on the fact that AI will replace teachers, maybe. But I see there where we still need this human touch, for example, kindergarten, we need this human touch. We need to give them empathy. We need to help them. And also even in a company, we still need these L&D people to coach because it's not one or the other. It's a combination of both. So FAI tell the coach that this person is not confident in what they are doing and coach this person, especially on that topic. And then we have the win-win. This is the symbiosis of the human and machine knowledge that we can use. And there are many technologies like that already available. So mm. I, I see a lot of opportunities there. And of course, I guess the biggest resistance is people's fear of, of that technology and fear of what it might do. Right? And um, and 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 that's that's very sad because I I agree with you one hundred percent. I think this augmented intelligence, which is this kind of human AI interaction, um, is is going to be the dominant way forward. I don't think it's going to be human only or AI only. You know, it, it's going to be the interaction of how humans work in the most efficient and effective way possible <clears throat> with technology, and that that seems to be very much the yeah, the kind of underpinning of of your book is is the more we can embrace the technology, the more we can in, enhance the way that we work with technology. Yeah, the the more we will start to see significant improvements, not only in learning and development, but in our businesses and also in our societies and and globally, you know, our world. So, just. Um, I guess the um, the next question is that I want to ask is this some, something that I've always kind of struggled with a little bit is is we talk a lot about learning and it's it's easy to learn something um, or some people might disagree with me and say it's actually really hard to learn things but but learning is really only the first step and I think what a what a lot of where a lot of challenges take place is on this journey from learning to mastery and being able to take applied knowledge and then being able to master it in such a way that you can be really effective at implementing that knowledge. And, and often there's a lot of blended frameworks and things taking place and knowledge builds on knowledge. Do, do you see that, that kind of transition from knowledge to mastery as, as being a, a big challenge in, in the industry today? Well, yes and no. Uh, I discuss also the five moments of need methodology in my book, where apply is actually the most important part. Um, I think indeed if we just do trainings, as my father used to do in the 70s and the 80s, we don't focus on the application, on the performance management. Uh, you can't do a one-year performance review to see if they master the knowledge. Again the data, the technology, mm. we can do a lot to see if they master the knowledge. Micro-learning platforms, asking from time to time, do this, do this assignment, to see if you master them. I know, for example, uh, Exonify, they have this confidence-based learning in it to see if they master the knowledge, if they are actually just like, uh, yeah, I think it is this, then you can coach, especially on the mastering part. So I think technology can also help us to bring training to learning to mastering, and it, it's all to apply the knowledge that we have. Mm. On the other side, uh, there is a lot of learning that we don't have to master. Information, being informed is also learning. You talk about fear of learning. If I 
tell somebody you need to learn this they actually are get fear because they think if I don't learn this if I don't master this I'm not gonna get my promotion I'm gonna get fired or whatever so there's a lot of emotions when it comes mm. to learning uh, and and this is fear and I think uh, if we focus more on why do we need to learn this when I explain to you if you learn this you can do this job not in five hours, but in three hours to to become more mastering in it. So I think we need to discuss more with the people why we learn. Uh, that's a big opportunity. Mm. I always look for opportunities, you know. Uh, this is an opportunity for the L&D department. This is a big opportunity to create a culture with a growth mindset where learning is no longer a tantalus tournament, you know, Latin, we study Latin, mm -hmm. also Greek, something it's, it's trying to achieve and you will know that you will never become a master because at the time that you're almost there, something will change. Mm -hmm. And you have to take a next step. Nick Van Dam in his book describes it also as the M model for learning and the T model for learning. In the old days, we went to the university, got a master, <laughs> and we were assumed to master something. Today, the knowledge that we learned at the university to become a master in anything, even a data analyst. Next year, you need to do it different. So we need to relearn try to master never try to be perfect because by the time that we are there we need to relearn so the mm. only thing that we need to master is the joy of learning and and that is a really interesting question in its own right <clears throat> because i think if i've never spoken to anybody who who's not expressed a desire or passion to learn something um and that that shows up in so many different ways in our lives. You know, if we we get a we get a hobby, and we just want to like sink our whole selves into that. You know, we want to kind of know everything there is to know about it. Um, and the same applies in our working lives. I I don't I don't think I've spoken to anybody who's ever said, no, I'm actually good where I am with my career. I don't want to learn anything more. I'm done. Um, unless of course they're on the cusp of retirement, maybe. But generally, people are really ex ex like naturally, intrinsically motivated to learn. Yet, the way that we learn seems to be the thing that starts to kind of of disintegrate and 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 kind of crumble around us. You know that that often we see things like low completion rates in e-learning because people start on this journey and then they very quickly just fall off. And you talked a lot about almost that kind of that initial impetus, you know, which you explained is is this is why I want you to learn. This is this is why you need to learn. But but you finished it very beautifully by saying, you know, the one thing people to need to actually learn is a love for learning. Why? So how do we then kind of of teach that love for learning? Because it seems that you know, if if you take a look at at e-learning completion rates, they sit anywhere between five to fifteen percent. So that's a whopping number of people who never really finish what they start. Can I ask you a bold question? Please do. When was the last time that you completed an e-learning? Um, I, I generally tend to stay away from it. Um, yeah, you I'm not a big your, fan. You gave your answer yes. because it's not compelling. It's not fun. It's boring. Mm. You get distracted. It's 30 minutes of boredom in 99% of the cases. Mm. That's why I want to change the way that we do corporate learning, make it more lean in the moments of needs, make it micro learning. And mm. also micro learning, because sometimes they ask me, oh, we wanna do micro learning. And I say, for what? If it's a compliance training to work in a bank, well, I'm sorry, I think you need to fulfill your 30 minutes because that's the rules. But mm. in many other cases, we don't need e-learning. We need to know what we need to know in the moment of need. And I think that's the biggest misconception is that I was recently talking to a, a company and they said, yeah, I think we need to, we have a problem. Our e-learnings are not compelling enough. People don't like it. We need new design. And I was like, 
Why do you need new design? Yeah, because it needs to be more uh, modern in look and feel. I said, why does it need to be more modern? And I started doing my annoying why questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at the end, they didn't do a, you know, in marketing, when I want you to change your behavior, I have your personas. I know, for example, a young girl, 21, she wants to be use the neuroscience that they do in marketing addressed in this way. Why in L&D don't we learn more about neuroscience for learning, about what we can learn from marketing? How can they make me change my favorite chocolate from brand A to B? Because they know all this. So in e-learning, we can't do this. But if we do, for example, in a learning ecosystem where we use different channels, Hey, if you know the personas in marketing, you know which channels. If you want to reach a 20-year-old, probably you need to go to Instagram. If you want to reach my father, maybe you still need to go to Facebook. So these different channels linked to different personas, they create huge advantages for companies. And it will reduce the cost as well. So it's, it's, it's not about the joy for learning, if you reach people where they want to be, then the learning is just much easier. You know that I ask children, how do you prefer to learn? Where do you learn most, from your teachers or from TikTok? They will all say TikTok. TikTok mm -hmm. is giving me very easy tricks on this and this and this. They explain it much easier. Books are becoming popular again thanks to TikTok. So the joy of learning, if TikTok, a social media platform, can have children reading books again, then teachers should learn how TikTok got there where they never got to get children to read. So I think we have to rethink everything. Forget about e-learning only. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there are millions of people out there, you know, like like in Star Wars when they blew up Alderaan and they said, I've heard 5 million people all screaming at once. I think that was also a description of e-learning. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I guess, you know, the, the other thing I'm really curious about is because you've done a lot of, of um, research into technology, wh which is the one that you're most excited about? Yeah, which is the one you think Damn, this is going to be amazing. Well, every day it's another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, I also like those technologies that freak me out. So a couple of months ago, I was reading about a study. They were using um, a brain of a mouse, injecting it with stem cells of a human, and then did uh, reinforced learning techniques as they do on AI to teach this thing <laughs> to play the game of Pong, like Neuralink did with a chimpanzee. Now they are doing it. Um, I don't know what to name it. And, and you realize works. that there was a cartoon called Pinky and the Brain, and it sounds like these guys are essentially reenacting that cartoon. Well, but the thing is, they, th what they want you to do is then to add this people brain mm -hmm. part, don't know how to name it, to artificial intelligence to make that more human. Well, I don't know where they're going. So I was really, I wanted to know more. So I'm still looking up everything that I can find about these experiments. This is freaking me out, but I'm mm. following it because it makes me curious. The okay. other hand, more applicable, uh, what I'm uh, looking at today, which is more relevant for the people maybe listening, is what they call knowledge experience platforms. Um, there are some, uh, I actually have two platforms. There are some technologies that they're working on around the globe. And one is these knowledge experience platforms that, and it's much to where I come with my learning ecosystems. If you're, for example, a consultant and you need to make a offer or a, I don't know, uh, a paper for a customer, then you know that many of your colleagues probably had the same questions. We're working on the same things. This technology is tapping all the intelligence in the company. So they tap into your uh, legacy systems, in your mail systems. They can even tap into the social media platforms of the people in the system. 
Again, remember, external consultants, sometimes not in the company. I only found one company in Munich, Germany, where also external consultants were part of the knowledge experience platform. They reduced their time of, for making new material with more than 50-60%. So it's lean learning. They got every information they needed in the moment of need. I love this. These knowledge experience platforms where they use AI to do expert location. I love it. Um, another one where I see a lot of improvements recently are performance management systems, where we don't look at um, a one-year performance review, but where we can link one, and I always call it this Lego piece, again, linked to all the other technologies in the company, where they have an app, a very simple app, that say, this is where you want to go, this is your talents, this is the company performance report, the numbers, the strategy of the company. These are all the L&D systems that we have, an LMS system, a this, a blah, even the Coursera's of this world, so learning systems outside the company. You link them all together and a person can know every step of the day, this is my assignment for tomorrow, this is my corporate goal for tomorrow, here I can find the information to help me reach this goal. Leaders can track on an individual level and on a team level performance of the company related to the people working there. I know both of the IDs mm -hmm. in Europe, which are cheap, uh, with, with GDPR, sometimes it's difficult. But again, we see the problems, privacy. The opportunity for tomorrow is if we can work around ethical and um, compliance, and rules for this, it will help the people. So th those are my two areas that I'm mm. looking at now. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the I mean, obviously, obviously the, the, the compliance is a big challenge and, and, um, and at the risk of basically being, having a bunch of people from the FBI or whatever the compliance bodies are knocking on my door. How much do you advocate people ask for forgiveness and not permission. In other words, how do you, how much do you encourage kind of them, they'll encourage the mavericks of the world to go out there and actually break stuff rather than to try and follow the rules? <laughs> well, one of my favorite books always was The Lynch Pinch from Seth Godin. And we mm. now see a lot of books coming on with rebels and we need rebels mm. in the organization. The Lynch Pinch, I, I, 20 years old, I think, from Seth mm. Godin, is we need those people breaking stuff in the company. Uh, I'm, I'm really good at breaking stuff, by the way. Um, but it's also, again, oh, I'm sorry, this is police. <laughs> yes, okay. I was expecting them to come to my doorstep, not yours, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're not coming from me. Um, no, so um, I, I'm into the breaking part. Mm. Uh, you need, maybe you know, Balbin and team roles, and a good team always has this one person doubting everything, trying to new things. And this is why I like to do my workshops on uh, continuous improvement, because we, we do a one day, what if, what if we could reinvent the world? So in the morning we mm. talk about the problems and then we say, we put the problems on the wall, what if? And the funny thing is we always think that what we are trying to achieve is impossible, but again, think then back, slow steps, if we wanna get there. What can we already do now? Forget about the obstacles. What can we do? So dream big, but also start mm. implementing it. And yeah, maybe you break some stuff, but that's what they say, fall fast. Mm. All right, so kind of closing off, two final questions for you. Um, the one is, is um, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but maybe just just to kind of bring it back to to that kind of, of one next thing is is I think the you know the, the kind of concept of learning ecosystems and moving learning out of just the L and D department into into the organization as a whole, turning it into strategy, dealing with technology, dealing with human behavior and dynamics. And we've talked about a whole spectrum of things. And the one word that kind of probably sits in everybody's mind is complexity. Um, there's so much. There's so much stuff there. It's like it starts to become a wicked problem. And 
you're now sitting in the in I guess the shoes of this learning and development manager who's thinking, pardon the language, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> what what what's the what's the one thing i suppose like you know it's it's that kind of confucius journey of a thousand miles starts with one step what is that one step that you would suggest to people yeah to kind of of do to start down this journey just i love the question ask your stakeholders to sit in with you and when I mean stakeholders, I mean a people from the business, maybe even from the union, especially when you're from Belgium, like me or Germany, ask the unions to sit in, uh, ask a leader, uh, really like all the stakeholders from the organization, maybe even a client and ask them, what can we change? I always start with just let them explain the problems that they face now, Ruth Goss, analyze why is this a problem, and then do this dream session about what can we change. The thing is, when you do this, opportunities present themselves. You can start with little things. For example, if you discover that um, in retail, your people working in the stores they only stay for one year with the company. So training them three weeks on all the products is just a waste of time and money. So what can we do different? Is maybe a micro learning platform good for us? But never start with a technology. Always start from opportunity for change and people. If you're an L&D person, I always say, if you think you have a problem and you talk to people in technology, your problem will be bigger. Try to figure it out yourself first. Brilliant. And then you talked about this concept of lifelong learning, l learning to love to learn. And the, the last question we always like to ask our guests is a recommendation for the last book or podcast that you've really absolutely been fascinated about or enjoyed, just to share that with the audience. Well, I read a lot of books. I read too many books. Um, if I get halfway a book and still not bored, then you have a really good book. Recently, I was reading a book. Uh, it's uh, from Stella Collins, The Neuroscience of Learning. And as I am also a marketer in my background, this is one of the books that I loved most because it was going back to people to being human. It's not about technology. Hmm. And this is a book that I can highly recommend, Neuroscience for Learning. And it's also a book, I, 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 I want to write another book again, uh, The Leading Learner. How can we become learners? How can we enjoy learning? And in this book from Stella Collins, you will start to love learning again. Okay, well, that sounds that actually sounds like the one next thing that everybody should do is is read that book. But before you do that, yeah, before you read that book, I suggest that you actually read this one first. Um, so, Katja, it's been absolutely wonderful having you, um, and we could have probably carried on speaking for hours. There's about 15 different topics I didn't even touch on, and and the one that you happen to finish off with, which is you know, behavioral dynamics and understanding how to nudge people and, and getting positive behavior changes in an area I'm particularly fascinated about. But thank you so much um, for, for joining on this show. And it was um, a pleasure. Thank it's you, been amazing having you. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Impact Learning Visionaries. If you found it interesting or helpful, please subscribe by clicking on the button down below so you don't miss our next one. Also, be sure to check out our Reality Bytes blog for more information on how technology is aiding in learning development. Links are all in the description below. Go check it out. Thanks a lot. Bye.